Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today we're joined by Kaylin Radcliffe of Lupio, currently running revenue operations at Lupio. Kaylin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. And I believe, I haven't checked this with you, Kaylin, before, but I believe you're part of the Vidyard Mafia because <laughs> we've, had, we've had a number of Vidyard either employees or alumni on the show and it seems like that company has been producing some incredible operations people. We've had an amazing team and I think they still do. So good place to get new leads from. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Maybe we should, that's like, we should do the whole podcast can just be Vidyard people or or alumni. Um, It it was Joe Galata, right? Who was one of the leading lights. He was, he actually was there before I joined. Um, So we never worked together, but him and I believe you had Jen Laurie on earlier. Yes, we had Jen. They worked together. So I got the benefit of the foundation he laid, but but not the benefit of working with him. For sure. People say, some say he's the godfather of revenue operations, but who knows? Anyway, <laughs> I don't know. Kaylin. Maybe. <laughs> we're not here to talk about Joe, we're here to talk about you. So um, what I would like to know, because I, I, I do see that you were in sales at one point. Yep. But then you spent a significant amount of time in the past few years in revenue set and sales operations. So could you tell me about the transition and how you got into operations? Yeah, so like you said, I started off my career in ed tech sales, um, early stage, smaller company, and just always found myself looking for efficiencies, processes, how could we scale that across new people, um, and actually kind of stayed in that sales capacity, and then went on maternity leave, and we were relocated to Chicago. The CEO of that ed tech company introduced me to one of his Harvard alum, who was Tracy Britt Cool, who is one of Warren Buffett's kind of protégés. And she was just um, taking CEO role at Pampered Chef at the time. And she kind of sold me on her vision for creating this small, scrappy team um, driven towards operational excellence. So I jumped ship on the ed tech company and decided to join her in kind of that that quest. And that was my first foray into what is now RevOps, but more in an ops, um, non-SaaS capacity then. Got it. And at that point, you didn't have like core operations experience, but the CEO you're working on under saw your, your ability to improve the sales process. Yeah. Always looking at like, what was our, our win rate? You know, where were things falling apart in the funnel? How could we improve that? What were the processes, the frameworks, the systems? I was already doing those things in my own role and as new people joined the company. So kind of saw that I already had that, that interest and that curiosity. Got it. So you're basically doing sales operations and sales. At the same yeah. Time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, so if we zoom in today at Lupio, um, how many sales and CS reps fall below or fall within revenue operations? And then how many ops people do you have supporting them? So the RevOps at Lupio um, is a team of four. Um, we have the CRO, myself, and then our, our two team members, which is a systems, senior systems manager, and then a newly joined kind of RevOps specialist, generalist kind of role. Um, yeah. And then we have about 30 um, people across like CX and, and sales and the SDR team that, that we're kind of working with. Got it. So 30 across CX and sales. So that's a, a four to 30 ratio from my marketing (laughs) we also uh, have marketing yep and and do you guys support marketing as well yep Uh, Yep. cool and then that's a team of 15 god that makes sense um so that's about right for my for my discussions on this I, i i like to look at the ratio between ops and actual uh reps and that's about dead on like one to 15 is like the average i've seen so you're about there um okay and the current sales tech stack Sales. So obviously we are a Salesforce house, um, which I think most companies that I've worked with are. We're using Pardot um, on the lead side. We have Outreach. Uh, we're using Gong. Um, we just bought CPQ. Those are kind of like the main main tools that we're using there. Got it. Yeah. And is CPQ a tool or is that just uh, a name for a category? Um, so CPQ is like Salesforce's quoting. Okay. Um, Makes sense but kind of like an add-on that, that you either kind of need or, or have an inflection point where you want. 
Got it. Um, and now focusing at, out of the 30 people, how many are sales reps versus success? Um, it's about half and half. Got it. So we've got yep. 15 reps. Can you can you remember a time where you've done something that has made them that has improved productivity significantly for those 15? So we, when I joined, um, the team was selling into all markets, all verticals, just kind of haphazardly. Um, so kind of one of my big initiatives right out of the gate was to segment the team into SMB, mid-market, and enterprise, and then understand what industries within those specific segments we were really seeing the most traction into to focus the team. And I think we've seen a lot of, a lot of early wins coming out of that, just that focus. I mean, that, that totally makes sense, right? Like if yeah. you have great case studies, you work really well with specific industries, then why would you not double down? Right. Um, were the marketing team, were they helpful in that exercise or did they already have like the niching down? Like how did that work with marketing? So the VP of marketing joined around the same time that I did. So he, we kind of decided that he was going to focus on his team and kind of rebuilding from the ground up. And I was going to focus on the sales team right out of the gate. So we kind of decided to run separately um, on those things. So kind of jumped right into sales as the, the biggest area of impact and left cool. marketing to reorg. But then I assume you, you both focused on the same industries. Like once you said, uh, Software companies is a good industry. You, For sure. Yeah. So the demand side of marketing um, definitely just mm -hmm. aligned to the segments and in the industries that we picked based on the data that we ran. Because um, obviously you need to be all, all marching in the same direction. Got it. And on that point regarding data, is your team responsible for the data quality in Salesforce? For sure. Yeah. So you manage and you make sure there's no duplicates. You, you make sure everything's perfect for the sales team. Perfect. Yes. That <laughs> at is, all times. It actually exists. Yeah. I think, I mean, when you join RevOps or you start a RevOps team, it's not, is there data quality um, issues? Because there's always going to be. It's kind of how bad is it? Where are the skeletons? And then prioritizing what you need to fix first um, based on the, the impact of the business. Got it. And, and is that the systems managers per, make, like core responsibility? It is now. Um, so I joined Lupio in June um, and kind of did a bunch of like organizational changes. And then she joined in late September to kind of build the data and the structures and the processes once we kind of knew what the business should be doing. Got it. And so when you joined, were you the only person in RevOps? Yes. Uh, alongside the CRO. And then you've recently hired these two guys. Yep. The guy for girls. Okay, awesome. Yep. Um, are we looking to hire any more roles into the RevOps team? I don't know. Um, it's kind of one of those departments where because we're, our mandate is efficiency, I'm never going to want to hire ahead. But as soon mm. as we start to see those needs or areas where we really understand that we could get a great ROI out of adding someone else, then I definitely will. Sure. Um, can we talk about onboarding reps now? Do you have yes, any best practices definitely. or any, anything to share? Yes, yeah, so we've had um, we also introduced the sales enablement role, uh, which we rolled into our senior director of sales. I think there's always a better synergy if those teams are one. Um, and my big focus with him has been, has been working on what is the time to first deal for a new rep? So getting somebody ramped as quickly as possible because then they understand who we're selling to, the messaging generally um, how to demo successfully. They've obviously wrapped their head and their hands around the tools and the processes that we're using. So that's kind of our first benchmark. And then how do, how do we get that person or those people ramped to 100%? It's kind of the next milestone. Got it. So that person, the sales enablement person, sits next to the sales director or with the sales director. He's not in the seat in your team. Correct, yep. Cool. And then his job now is to... Reduce time to first deal. That's like the Correct. metric he's tracking. Cool. Yep. And have you seen, have you been able to reduce that? And if, have you, like, is there one thing that you have done that has impacted that? Or yeah. So historically, we had pretty patchy performance. We'd have a cohort that would start and they would do great and they would have, you know, fairly strong consistency. And then we saw a period of time where our new reps just weren't performing for us. Um, and we weren't getting to that place where it was consistent. So we introduced the sales enablement role. 
really kind of honed them in on time to first deal. And we've seen since then the three new reps that have joined all had a deal in their first month. Um, and nice. typically that was that was anywhere between like three months to six months on the longest end. Um, so we've seen seen some good early wins out of that. Yeah, I bet the CRO and the sales director were happy with that. Yep. And I think the, the big focus there was do you have the pipeline to get you to that first deal? Do you understand what navigating a sale looks like at Lupio? So just kind of breaking it down to like, what are the two or three things? Because A's are focusing on so many things, I think it can get overwhelming for them. So break it down to like the three things that they need to be thinking about to get to that first deal. Got it. Yep. Um, can we... Talk about sales forecasting. So is that your responsibility? Yes. And yep. what if the process from like going from getting the forecast from the reps to reporting to CRO? Or... Yes, yeah, so we kind of do it in two parts, which I've kind of always done in my career and found that it worked well. So I will go away and complete my own sales forecast with what I know about the business. So what are we entering the quarter with in terms of pipeline? Where is that pipeline in terms of stage? Because I can know my win rate by stage. What pipeline do we typically create and close in any given quarter? So what can I create and still see the fruits of in that quarter? And then I will come up with kind of what we call our top-down forecast. And then we use Salesforce forecasting for the reps and the managers. So we map um, where every deal is in the pipeline to a forecast category based on stage and they can manually edit them if they disagree with them. But basically, that presents us with our bottoms up. And then we just work together to understand like what the gap is and how we get more um, proficient at forecasting with accuracy. Got it. So you're actually producing two. There's your one, and then there's the bottom-up one. For sure. I think there's been a lot of value in understanding like where we have performed and what the business has looked at. Um, and look like and then what are the reps saying and where is that gap or that disconnect because usually um, you have a sales team and depending on the personality I think the joke at Berkshire Hathaway was forecasting tells you very little about your business and a lot about the people forecasting so you either have like super aggressive reps who are really bullish on their deals and their forecast is always way over their actuals um, or the inverse of that where you have reps who like to come in and and kind of steal the show and, and overperform. So I think it tells you a lot about the people you're working with. So it's good to have both. I really like that quote, by the way. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I totally agree. It's almost like well, at Epster, we, we have this and we kind of know who who, who is who. And so right. we apply almost a, 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 a variable to 100%. this person. <laughs> yep, yep. This person t likes to sandbag and say that they're not going to do well and then they like to mm. kind of crush it and that's their personality versus this person always says they're going to bring in a million dollars and they bring in $10. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you might have already mentioned this, but if you could only measure one sales metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? One sales metric for the rest of my career. I mean, other than ARR? <laughs> um you could you mm, that's, that's probably quite a good one isn't it yeah um but let's if i were to say you weren't if that's the only one you couldn't measure okay which would you um, choose i think i would probably look at the count of ops versus the sum of your pipeline um because i think you can know a lot and the sum of your pipeline the, the value of it can hide a lot of things that the count can't um, so probably the count of opportunities you have open in any given period would be an important one. Got it. Yeah, that totally makes sense because you could have like two deals, but one really big right. versus. So that right. gives you a better idea of the health. Yeah. Um, I thought, I mean, you could have said time to first deal, but I guess that's just not as crucial as understanding how many ops you have in the pipeline, right? Yep. Because cool. that tells me about hiring. That tells me about the business health. That tells me a lot of things that, that time to first deal doesn't cover. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then final question is who in your career has educated you the most about sales operations? I think everyone. Um, I think I'm just one of those people that is constantly learning. I hope I never get to a place where I feel like I know the answer to most things. Um, so I think the biggest value that I've gotten is just being that sponge and be willing to learn from everyone. 
you know, if, if you can learn something great from an SDR and take that and translate it into your job, do that. Um, I also have an amazing network that I've kind of formed. You talked to, about some of them with the amazing people I worked with at Vidyard uh, or in the past. And then I have some great, great mentors. So I think my advice would be find a network, surround yourself with other people in the space, not in the space, read a ton. There's great like podcasts and resources. Um, I mean, you're doing a lot of great stuff. So I think just immerse yourself in that world and learn. Is a really good answer. Thank you, Kaylin. Now, here are the things that I picked out. Um, I mean, first of all, the quote about forecasting telling you a lot about the people, not the business, is super yep. interesting. Um, you and the VP of marketing coming in and segmenting by industry is obviously like that's just fundamental, right? And I, it must have had a great impact. And yep. then the other one I've written down here is yeah, I mean, having one person just being responsible for this single metric time to first deal. When you are onboarding a significant number, like that's that's also going to have a massive impact, right? Um, yep. If you can afford to have that sales enablement person, of for course. Sure. Yep. Um, but there we go, Kaylin. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, for sure. Anytime. <laughs>